Welcome to Slash Forward. The question we'll be examining this week is to what degree you would wish to be eaten by Colin Farrell. This will be unpacked via a quick movie recap of his 2011 film, Fright Night. Charlie Brewster is back, again, for the first time, trying to navigate the awkward social pressures and situations imposed by his peer group while also dealing with the very likely possibility that a seductive and very, very sexy vampire has moved in next door. As the danger becomes apparent, he struggles to figure out a way to destroy the threat while also mitigating any potential danger to his friends and family. As we work our way through, we'll have to figure out what, in real life, can actually kill a vampire, since life, after all, is not the movies. Although this is a movie, but also the intent is to depict real life. So the question remains. For now, while you're here, dropping a comment on a video really helps out, and feel empowered to check out some of the other vampire lore that's been covered on the channel already. Let's get to it. We open on a dark and stormy night, floating over a little suburban subdivision before phasing into a living room where they're watching, not Chris Angel. As we follow the POV of the family dog, our view floats back to a bedroom where a young lad flees a gruesome crime underway. He runs upstairs to hide amongst the corpses of his family and arm himself with the household revolver. As a final farewell, his old man gifts him the key to the trigger lock, but ultimately his demise is too fast and scary for this to make any difference. The next morning, as the neighborhood comes to life, we find Charlie walking his defunct dirt bike back home. He pauses momentarily for some self-aggrandizing chit-chat. You're getting big. And to read the message printed on Doris's butt. He then helps his mom Jane prepare for a hard day of hard selling as she tries to puzzle out what their dumpster neighbor could possibly be renovating to generate all that concrete. Then Charlie's best gal Amy rolls up to give him a ride to school, where he struggles on the daily to sort out what's cool or not cool. His shoes are a winner. But then Amy declares that prom equals not cool, so who knows? But he's figuring some things out as he pulls a fadeaway on that venti mochaccino like he didn't even care that it cost $8. In a brief scene, we learn that Roll Call identifies some conspicuously absent fellow chums. And afterward, his old friend Ed pulls him aside to enlist his help in looking for one of their mutual friends who seems to be missing. But Ed's existence is really cramping his newer, fresher style, you know? And anyway, real chads don't worry much about their imperiled friends, but Ed has some juicy blackmail material and applies just the right amount of pressure here. He and Amy get home later to find Jane garden flirting with the potential new daddy. They meet Jerry, their new neighbor, and are instantly drawn in by his animal magnetism. He endears himself to the family and very nearly manages to draw a drink out of Jane, but she's wily and her life experience has taught her how to identify a player and steer clear of that train wreck. Charlie then gets a pictorial reminder about his scheduled rendezvous at Adam's house, and so he excuses himself to meet up with Ed. With no foreplay whatsoever, Ed thrusts himself through the doggy door, and then pushes the details of his vampiric theories upon us. He and Adam had been mapping out recent reports of missing people and bite attacks about town. The pattern centers in on Jerry, the new guy, who also happens to have blackout curtains all over his house. He also explains the rules that vampires have to be invited in, and you can only kill them by staking them in their nest. But with the risk of the plot advancing too quickly, they pump the brakes on this info dump by introducing some animus over the matter of their wilting friendship. On his way home, Ed is taught a lesson about boarding on Mark Street after dark, forcing him into the back alleys of the neighborhood. He's confronted here by Jerry and attempts to hide out in a household. Unfortunately, it is an abandoned property, so Jerry's got free reign. Try as he might, Ed puts off a very signature scent that's easy for Jerry to follow. He ultimately catches up with him in the pool, wading in with blatant disregard for the condition of his leather wristlet, so you know it's serious. He points out how purpose-built Ed seems to be for this type of life, and then he turns him something fierce. The next day, Ed is added to the list of absentees, so Charlie ditches out and heads straight to his house to find out what up. Ed's not home, but Lisa Loeb is there, which is odd. They allow him to go search his room for a book he claims to need. And while there, Charlie scours his research, pushing past Peter Vincent to find his surveillance videos, in which Jerry does not appear. After searching for four or so hours, apparently, Charlie arrives home to learn that Jerry is in a bit of a jam. 
He has a choice Betty coming over for some cervezas, but he happens to be fresh out. Charlie agrees to hook him up with his sixer and notices that Jerry only seems willing to follow him so far before stopping. He even toys with him a little to both confirm this and indicate to Jerry that he's savvy to what's going on here. Unfazed, Jerry starts analyzing his single mom situation, trying to be daddy by guiding him through the talk. And your girl, Amy, she's ripe. Yeah, for sure. And he's correct because she happens to be right upstairs, giving off some strong signals. But Charlie is preoccupied with the outside as Doris arrives at Jerry's house. He then body checks Amy, which somehow gets her out of the mood, causing her to storm off. Charlie wakes up later to a lady screaming and immediately dials 911. But when the officers arrive, Jerry practically charms her pants right off with a little guy talk about his sexual prowess. When they leave, so does Jer, so Char Char hops the fence and quickly locates the hide -a key to gain entry to the home. Inside, you're looking at your classic bachelor pad. Single chair in front of the TV, no pictures hung, etc. Charlie's evidence search is interrupted by Jerry's return, forcing him into a closet. While there, he finds a false door leading into a soundproof chamber with a series of rooms. He finds Doris here, but then finds out that he doesn't actually know how to pick locks. And then Jerry comes to check on his late night snack. He watches as Jerry gets himself all worked up and goes in for the kill, making direct eye contact with Doris as she's being drained. Jerry goes to relax with some real housewives, giving Charlie time to get the door open and help a very anemic Doris downstairs. After a couple of close calls, they are able to make it outside, but Jerry saw what they did, but it ends up not mattering even a little bit. When he gets home, he insists that his mom never invite Jerry into the house and that she stay away from him in general. Then he spends his time at school in the media center to research vampire hunting and neglect his personal relationships. Later, he decides to approach this from every avenue and heads down to the convention center where he casually works his way into a Peter Vincent dress rehearsal. After their run through, he's able to talk his way into a 10 minute meeting. As he gets a brief tour, he discovers that Peter is actually the man, at least when it comes to owning some bitch and vampire gear. The entertainer readies himself with a tumbler of absinthe and needs his leather-induced yeast infection like an actual loaf of bread, and then is surprised to find the young journalist before him is looking to actually learn about viable methods for killing vampires. He ends up coming on too strong and learns that Peter is not a true believer, and he has Charlie removed from his presence. Back at home, Jane wonders about her son's new decor aesthetic and hobbies. Then Amy arrives to also find out what's been going on with him lately, and Jerry is not far behind. He politely calls out for an invite into the home to discuss the matter of young Charlie breaking into his house. But Jane has her son's back and turns him away. Unfortunately for them all, Jerry is no longer interested in playing these little piggy games. The two ladies laugh at Charlie's assertion of vampirism right up until Jerry starts chunking up the backyard, tugging on their gas line and attempting to blast them out. They tear out of there, damaging the dirt bike in the process. Jerry is somewhat irrationally angry about this and chucks it into the back of their vehicle. Jane is still on the fence about this being a vampire situation, but before any further evidence can be presented, Jerry catches up with them and attempts to run them off the road. After blocking them, Charlie tries to convince Jane to run him down and is somehow able to make this happen by grabbing the wheel. They are successful in what Jane must consider a cold-blooded murder, but then the vampire issue is thrust upon her again when Jerry starts poking his little thingies through the floorboard. When they stop to address this, they get blasted from behind by none other than JD himself. He steps out and watches in horror as Jerry burpees the back end of the car and then dives in to neck him super hard. The meal really takes the edge off, so Jerry moves in slowly on Charlie while explaining to him the importance of staking the actual heart rather than just the chest. This is the perfect exposition for Jane to hear as she plants her flag. Charlie then casually flips their car onto him as he beelines for the closest hospital. Meanwhile, in a state of post-nut clarity, Peter Vincent glances at the photos Charlie left behind and notices marked similarities between them and one of his most precious source documents. Back at the hospital, the kids are hesitant to utilize the police due to the insanity of their story and their prior experiences. As they wait, Peter calls to invite them to his penthouse to discuss the matter further. When they arrive, he warns them that the picture indicates they're dealing with a very strong and dangerous breed that is likely looking to bolster their ranks by turning their victims. Then they get an unusual late night delivery, which is always welcome, but the courier turns out to be Ed. They have a brief exchange and learn that Ed is bitter that their failing friendship led to his current condition. Peter then attempts to duck into his panic room and removes a good portion of Ed's arm in the process. 
As the other two scour the personal museum for useful weaponry, Charlie settles in on a battle axe. With Ed still getting used to his new powers, Charlie's able to nearly remove his head, but doesn't quite get through the bone. While in another room, Amy's able to effectively utilize some holy water to prevent Jerry's advance. Ed tries to get a bite off on Charlie, but struggles with his head flopping around like that. Amy then smashes his face up real good, allowing Charlie to get some practice finding the heart. They then try to slip away amongst the club rats, but Jerry is close behind and they end up getting separated in the frenzy for free t-shirts. Jerry ushers her away and is able to entice her into sneaking a gnarly little bloody kiss, resulting in her then giving in fully to his wiles as Charlie is dragged off by a bouncer, who recognizes that his flannel indicates he doesn't belong here. He then circles back to Peter Vincent, intent on insisting that he help him get his girlfriend back. However, after losing his family to vampires as a young boy, he just can't bring himself to venture back into the lion's den. Instead, he gifts Charlie a stake that was blessed by St. Michael and is supposed to turn victims of vampires back into regular folks. As a new dawn rises, Charlie hits the army surplus store early to score all the best equipment. He quickly bursts into Jerry's home and starts lighting the place up. After a brief Amy sighting, Charlie runs into Peter, who has had a change of heart, and he showed up just in time to reveal some of the tricks of his trade, uncovering a trapdoor that leads to a freshly dug up basement dungeon. They follow the sound of Amy's voice, presuming this to be a trap, and being correct in that presumption. Jerry walks down Peter and doinks him in the forehead with a pebble. And this doesn't seem like much at the time, but the spilling of blood on these sacred grounds actually awakens an army of ghouls. Charlie's been closed in with Amy, who's feeling the full weight of her new thirsty compulsions. However, when she cocks back for a huge bite, she ends up thrusting herself upon the sacred stake. When Charlie gets back out to the main chamber, the ghouls are going to town on Peter. But Charlie's able to knock out a few floorboards, which provides them with a modicum of protection for now. Peter begins to lightly smoke as he turns, putting a definite limitation on their time here, which they appear to be destined to spend watching as Jerry goes in hard on Charlie's girlfriend. But Charlie uses this distraction as an opportunity to set himself on fire to teach Jerry a lesson and he attaches himself to the vampire as a means of ensuring his extended misery and to prevent him from getting his wits about him. When they finally land in a sunray, Jerry's chest starts to pull back a bit, giving Charlie a clear target for inserting his stake. After Jerry is reduced to dust and ash, his victims are then freed from their curse. As a special treat, after everyone's all healed up and healthy, Peter makes provisions for the use of his bearskin rug in the copulation of his underage friends. I didn't set out to do so many modern remakes recently, but that seems to be the way things are working out. Since the main theme of these videos have been to compare the newer counterparts to the original, I will do that again for the 2011 Fright Night. While some of the others have focused on whether the remake is better than the original, I think this one would be better spent discussing why it's not better than the original. Although it is a good film overall, I think it had several deficiencies that can't be overlooked, and that represent a missed opportunity to really set itself apart and be great on its own terms. These fall under the category of trying too hard to follow the format that was provided with the original, but updating it by injecting unnecessary tropes without actually making sure they had a strong and clear storyline with good character development. The first indicator of this comes from the movie's runtime. It's a fairly long movie. Despite its length, it had multiple segments of pure expositional dump outs to explain the rules of the game and bring everyone in the film and audience up to speed. Despite this, one recurring gag was that nothing worked quite the same in real life as it does in the traditional lore. <laughs> How cheeky! The ultimate length of the film is even more surprising in contrast to how quickly they got to the point and revealed the underlying threat to the characters, as well as the fact that it felt like necessary scenes had definitely been cut from the movie. Charlie left papers at Peter's penthouse, so maybe Peter has his phone number from that and was able to call him at the hospital? But it was somewhat odd that Ed and Jerry showed up at Peter's penthouse, and then Peter subsequently showed up at Jerry's house. They also revealed that Jerry was the vampire that killed Peter's parents. But vampires don't age normally, and there was no moment of recognition on Peter's Peter's part prior to that. Why would that be the case? But also, why does it even matter if this huge point, in that it represents the defining moment of the character's life, is never actually explored within the movie? This overarching theme of going through the motions is further accentuated by the clear attempt to play off the seduction theme from the original, in how the characters initially interact and by the fact that they cast Colin Farrell. However, this element quickly falls away and fails to come back into play until the club scene. But at that point, with all the action-adventure elements being pushed in our faces, we're no longer primed to view Jerry as a character who's dangerous in his subtlety. There's also a recent trend toward irreverent, self-aware humor in movies. 
It was once a funny quirk, but I'm beginning to find it intolerable, since it tends to come off as insincere. I don't remember what this was like in 2011, so maybe it was fresh back then. But now, it feels incredibly dated. I'm referring to the treatment of Ed's character. His motivations are strained, and suspension of disbelief is thrown out the window when he begins speaking as a vampire as though he knows he's in a movie and this turn of events is just silly. Conversely, the original Evil Ed was always an outsider looking to fit in and was barely tolerated by his peer group. He and Charlie never seemed to be more than acquaintances who were brought together through circumstance. Because of the way his character was handled in the original film, his death was a tragedy and the symbolism of his character was timeless. So, unlike some of the other films recently discussed, this was not just the refreshing of a timeless classic. This was more of a rehash of a timeless classic that was updated through the injection of a variety of unnecessary recent trends that anchor it to a particular point in time and remove its universal appeal. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.